Hey y'all, uh, it's uh, January 25th, 2019. You know, I've been thinking a lot, a lot recently, and uh, well, on my day of the Lord, the 19th of January, there was actually an article published that profiled citizens of Anchorage, Alaska, who uh, basically everyone in the article was like freaked out because of all these earthquakes, these tremors that have been happening since a major earthquake occurred, I think it was in November or December. And every time I see one of those earthquakes hit, uh, you know, near Anchorage, I always feel bad because when you read this article, it basically describes the people. They're like, "Look, like you feel helpless. You don't know what to do. You uh, you have anxiety, all this stuff." It's basically describing those sort of locusts or whatever from uh, I think it was chapter nine of Revelation, and they're supposed to torment uh, people for uh, five months, which was my whole thing. I'm like, "Day of the Lord starts a five month period of global anxiety." Okay, so where was I right? I was right in that when you read that article, I think it was CBS News, you see exactly what is described in Revelation uh, chapter 9 with the locusts. Um, where was I wrong? Was it global? No. But maybe it's the beginning of uh, more and more anxiety globally due to, you know, uh, natural phenomenon, earthquakes, climate, climate change, shit like that. Excuse me. Not that climate change is natural, it's man-made, but here's my point. A couple days later, there was, a, um, there was a, a set of surveys that were released. I think one by Yale and another one by, I don't know, another university. But basically saying that they haven't ever seen such huge percentage increases in polling numbers in such a short period of time. Where now, 70% of Americans are worried, anxiety again, about climate change. Uh, and something like 90 believe it, it's actually real. Um, now that was from December polling numbers. And, you know, now that it's almost, what, February, you know, those, if they've increased so much in the past two years, or three, I'm not sure if it was one or two or three years, is that, that, that they referenced this big jump in uh, people's anxiety levels. But even two more months from December, you tack the two months on, and then, you know, maybe the numbers are even higher than 70% now. My point is, in, in four or five more months, at the end of this five-month period, uh, they could be, you know, 75 80%. So that tracks with Revelation 9. Then people are supposed to start dying, right? I've been thinking a lot about this. In the book of Revelation, it talks about uh, flesh, you know, like these fowls. Uh, devouring the flesh of every man. It's like every man free in bond. Um, the point is that God's not going to kill everyone, but maybe what he's saying with the flesh is, or I guess when it was written, the concept was, you know, John of Patmos was saying, oh, everyone's going to die. But really, God, when he saw those words, he's like, okay, I got to solve for devouring of everyone's flesh. So maybe what God did is he said, all right, the flesh just means thinking about the material world, the world of the flesh, right? And to devour that means we're no longer going to be thinking in terms of materialism and, you know, uh, what's on the surface, what we can see, but we all redirect based off this little book that I'm writing. We all redirect to a more spiritual sense, which will then directly lower everyone's carbon footprint, everyone's happier, everyone acknowledges God to give him his glory, and uh, we go to heaven on earth. Now, in terms of uh, acknowledging God, the major way to get to uh, more spiritual, uh, spiritually aligned uh, way of thinking is to, um, is to confess your sins, right? And that's what it talks about in the book of Revelation. It's like, well, you know, you got to repent to give God his glory. Well, it sounds like if you just read that, that everyone's like freaked out. They're like, oh no, God's going to kill us. Like, we got we to admit everything we've done wrong. But really what it is, it's each confession shows the confessor that God was operating uh, the entire time in their lives, right? So when they admit everything they've done wrong, and all of a sudden their illnesses go away, mental or physical illnesses go away, then... Uh, it gives God glory in that the person recognizes that God was active in his or her life. Uh, and then, or whatever pronoun you want to use, 
and, uh, and also it allows everyone globally to see how he was operating the entire way. So basically he's been working behind the scenes this entire time and what this little book does is it helps us begin to finally understand using statistics uh, that he was operating the whole time and we realize that he was faithful, or sorry, what was it? His judgments were righteous and fair or whatever the entire time, but we can only see that when we admit everything we've done wrong together. And as a basic human right, we should all get a pass from a legal standpoint as this one-time reset kicks in. Um, and then that, hence, would get everyone on the right track to you know, think more spiritually as it's like, oh my God, my anxiety is gone. What happened? Oh no, it was God. Oh, he's here. Wow. You know, and people start to freak out in a good way. But because of this little book that's being written, it's really like a, uh, an instruction manual, which in chapter 10, when the book is finally um, released, it says that it, uh, it finally fin- it finishes the mystery of God, i.e. it replaces not calling every religious text before it um, you know, meaningless or discounting them. They were all necessary. Uh, they were necessary sort of to have to help me get here. But what it does is it consolidates and uh, distills all the ideas using a cool story. Um, you know, it distills everything into one dose where it's like almost... It's just easy to understand. And you need it because when you start to operate in the spiritual realm, it can be very overwhelming. This is why anyone who had, and I just wrote the foreword for the book, anyone who's ever had a hyper-religious experience, they wind up hospitalized, medicated, incarcerated, or dead because you got to put all this shit together. And at first, when you start to operate in a purely spiritual sense, it's very overwhelming, especially if you're older like me. I was 35 when it started to happen. You know, kids are a lot more uh, adaptable. So it's not as difficult, but you know, if someone's 70, 70 years old, they spent their whole life thinking in terms of the flesh, and then they transition to the more spiritual, then all of a sudden, you know, they're gritting their teeth, they stop, uh, you know, eating, they're up all, all the time, you know, and they start to break down. But with this, if you know what to expect going into it, hey, look, you may grit your teeth or grind your teeth, so you may want to a, a, a splint, make sure you rest because you have to maintain the Sabbath, um, you know, make sure you eat. Don't think that you're God. You're not being able to read everyone's thoughts. You can't uh, control the future. God only does that. He has full control of the world. But if God knows you believe and you're acting in a way that is um, magnanimous, then he'll make things happen for you. So you're not controlling it. Your mind is connected to him and then he's controlling it. And it could be misunderstood easily that you're the one controlling it, but he's the, the puppet master and he's just dialed into you. In your belief. Um, so anyway, so that's that's kind of how it. I think it works, uh, which is why it's necessary to have the book. And then when it says it's a little book, uh, a little book, um, I looked up, you know, the different variations of, of literary length or whatever. You know, you got a short story, which is like 10,000 words or, or fewer, or maybe up to 10 or 15,000 words. And then you hit the, oh, 10 to 15,000 or something is a nov- novelette. Then there's from 15 to 50,000 is like a novella. And then from 50,000 up is a novel. So like, you know, I think if it's somewhere between, right now it's 28,000 words or maybe 29,000 words. Somewhere in that novella range, I think makes it a little book, easy for people to read. There's a lot of information in there, but um, you know, you use the context of the story of my story to dissect that and then all of a sudden I can you know I can reference it at the end I'm like okay remember when that happened well then this and this and this and that's why you need a cool story for it to happen plus all the video footage that is posted and uploaded to YouTube showing the whole journal or journey uh, it all sort of works but you had to right out of the gate be recording every single thing so people would believe you and then also be able to see how you are and uh, and then also have the ability to you know piece it together understand the statistical component then write the novella, right? Then upload the novella. Have a PR person, which I have on hold. She'll read it, hopefully, and then go promote it. And then, uh, and then I can go and find someone who's blind. 
and just be like, hey, look, let's try this method out. And then they're like, oh, they can see. Simple. People freak out, and I'm just like, read the book. And it's not like a quick case like Jesus, poor guy, who just wanted to probably test the miracle component. And then everyone started to bum rush him, and he could never really think or pray alone. Uh, I mean, he could, but not as much as he would like to. But for me, because every single human being rejected me, I want to dedicate the book to everyone who rejected me. I'm like, this is the book dedicated to everyone who rejected me. You just list everyone out. Because without them and their rejection in 2019, none of this could have happened. If that makes sense. So, um, I think that's what I got. Hope you guys are well. I'm going to get back to writing and uh, listening to music. See ya.